Okay, can you elaborate on what you did with all of that information way back then? In other words, how was it used in, well, you used to train special forces, etc. Were you using it to manipulate those forces as well? Um, I wasn't even at that stage. I was trying to figure out how to talk to the brain using symbols and colors and sound. I wanted to develop a language that I could talk directly to the brain as a brain-mind interface. And uh, I did it using video feedback systems. And we discovered how to talk to specific neurotransmitters. And because we could talk to this neurotransmitter, that could talk to three other neurotransmitters, and we had access inside the blood-brain barrier. We could um, have a way that you could see images in your mind's eye that didn't come through the optic nerve. That was pretty cool. <laughs> and I mean, the, you know, okay, like the, but come on, uh, as a scientist, come on, as a responsible scientist, yeah. uh, what when you bypass the, the 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 mind and go directly to the brain, as you call it, and you bypass the optic nerve and go directly to the brain, you're also bypassing a certain filtering that the individual or rights that the individual might have, wouldn't you say? Because in, in other words, you're talking about direct suggestion. Yeah, that's is exactly there, is, right. You're, you're but, right. You're exactly so people right. don't have any, do they have any sort of built-in way of, of avoiding being influenced by that? Yes and no. You can fool people like stage magicians will make you walk on stage like a duck. Um, you allow them to do that. Uh, you can't make somebody do something they don't want to do, but you can fool them. Like, you know, is it door number A or is it door number C? And you don't even offer door number B, which is lying by omission kind of thing, which is the answer. In other words, there's no way they can be right. And you could play uh, optics games like that in decision-making with colors. And is this a blue or is this a green? How do you do that? And what does green trigger as a specific neurotransmitter response? And so we know that colors affected your moods. And so we started with those studies first. And it was a progression going down. Okay. Um, but they also can heal you. And there's also the notion that, uh, for example, green is often used uh, to program people. So well, tell right. us what... what Okay, what's associated with the certain colors, right? Uh, but, you know, there's systems of correspondence. The one that I chose to model for my path was from the Sefer Yetzirah, the Book of Formation, that relates sound and words. Uh, I've had options, you know, the there's chakra things and there's uh, Swami Gowami, uh, you know, metaphors but of green being the earth and, you know, safe, that kind of thing. That's what green usually means is you're safe. Uh, like blue is intellectual, yellow is very, you know, ideas, blah, blah, blah. That all is all from Eastern Theosophical Society kind of metaphor. And um, so Golden Dawn had systems, OTO had systems, Crowley systems were different. They were argued, they battled. I chose uh, hermetic Kabbalism and uh, try to remain as close as I can. I do uh, favor Aleister Crowley over Golden Dawn and Samuel McGregor Mathers, but what I did was my own scientific work and made other discoveries that were way beyond what the green color means. You know, it could do when moved with light blues and darker blues could instill a need to go to the bathroom just, you know, because of relaxing a certain sphincter muscle. And we could work it down to that level where we had control of the whole body in that sense of it. Kind of like you are right now. <laughs> uh, oops. <laughs> so what I want to know is you have your system. There's all these other systems. But just because you think you're using one system, if you're using a color and there are all these systems can attach different meanings to those colors, so what if you, as long as you project that color, it could actually be read at the other end and interpreted by any number of systems, not necessarily by yours. 
Right. We were trying to find cross-cultural forms that was independent of, you know, Iraq being Muslim as opposed to being in the United States and a Christian. Trying cross-cultural. And we made some discoveries, <laughs> kind of cool things, uh, in geometry that the geometry was gated. When you looked at sacred geometry, it would date uh, in a manner that actually was a, a question or a, or a statement to a group of neurotransmitters. We can make things happen that way, just by flashing a certain geometry with some colors. And guess what? Some of it looked like the tree of life. And so we got interested in looking at those systems that came from the old Bibles. And uh, there were, I think, technologies back then that used sound and movement, like dance, that is not a technology that we have in this epoch, that changed space-time. You know, I we're doing things with sound. I had it on Facebook, you know, where I'm using some sound and it's balancing rocks and moving them and spinning them and things like moving a pyramid. How did they do that? I don't know. So that was one of the studies that we were doing was on how geometry and movement of that geometry changed space-time. And that's where Roger Penrose and his geometric universe then came in and why I was studying under Penrose because of his Taurus Twister models. Um, he it was a mathematical physicist that wrote a book called The Geometric Universe. And his work is paralleled with uh, Hawking's who was white and black holes. They were quite different option, ways of looking at the universe, the white and black hole and the Taurus Twister space. And we discovered using the Taurus Twister space, we could unlock specific neurotransmitters. We could talk directly to them using that metaphor. <laughs> I know. No Thank sound. you for pausing. Uh, no, no, I mean, it's very interesting. So what, where you say that this information was then used, for example, on the Iraqi troops when they invaded? No, I know. No, no. This is way before Iraq. This is in the early 70s we did this. We okay, did so, but I mean, come on. It, uh, in the theater of war, and even <laughs> now, right, uh, with I'm Kate Helm? Yes? I have no idea. You probably no idea. Are more sophisticated. You know, the stuff I did is over 45 years old. And I know cloning emotions and synthetic telepathy. I know what that feels like. What I'm experiencing, like when I was talking with Jeff Rents and some others, um, is quite different. It's very subtle and uh, way smoother than the stuff I had. It's kind of like drugs. You know, dimethyltryptamine back when we were studying it was not ayahuasca. It was uh, telepathing. That's what it was called. Because if you used it a certain way, you were a fourth stage telepath. And that was got a lot of interest in a lot of military in the possibility of having a radio that you could transmit forward into the future. Uh, okay, that's quite interesting. <laughs> You're a real interest in that kind of stuff. And what we had to do is slow steps, Sally. You know, proceeding with what the nature of time is in terms of information. That's why we use the holographic model over a quantum model, which measures space and time. Everything is in space time. And we were discovering that there's a way you can access information points inside the brain that relate to the external world. That's the holographic model and resolution. And if you can do this with yourself, if you can envision in your mind's eye, most people can di create dimethyltryptamine by the chill that goes up their body. Yep, you just you did it just by thinking it. It's simple to do. That's dimethyltryptamine being released in your system. That is what it is. And so you now have a, a, an identification that you can start generating in certain positions so that you can use that light beam, let's say, to hit on the pineal gland. That's one of the projects that we did and will be in one of my workbooks for the power tools. The non-local mind is going to take the biofeedback that I talked about, brain waves and stuff like that, and move it to a whole nother level of optics where we have a visual system, which most people are visually centered. They, they use some olfactory for, for because it's directly into the brain and some taste. Most children start with taste and then go to optics like we are right now. Mostly we're visual. That is 
by the way, one of my gifts, I had a dedic imaging. I'm a dedic memory, which means I take pictures and like a little kid, <laughs> a little bright kid. You can be my handler or wrangler. There you go. Yeah. Okay. Uh, well, I'll I, behave. I'll behave. Uh, uh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be nice. Uh, so. <laughs> I love you. Okay. <laughs> I'm so easy. <laughs> Absolutely. But uh, look, so if you take your your this things you were working on and you go into MK Ultra, which was oh, happening. That was, that was earlier. Your MK Ultra was before. Okay, that. it was earlier, but it was going simultaneous because it never stopped. Okay? We've got Manchurian <laughs> candidates out there. there. Okay, wait, wait, wait. We've got false flags happening. You're aware of that. And yeah. you must be able to look at a false flag and see what they're using to, to, to basically, you know, say, look over here when something's happening over there and colors they're using and the whole nine yards, aud auditory stimulus. Come on. Y you must be able to do that. Well, that's what we were studying back in the early 70s. My school teacher will go, you know, the first grader, look, children over here, it's uh, Jade Elm. Oh, look, children over there, it's J2 software. Do you know that we now have software that can actually profile you so precisely, it's minority report. They know what you're going to do even before you do. Now, intent and purpose are subtly different but not at our particular level of awareness. And so the video feedback moves you to another level where you can at least take semi-control of how you train your mind. And so that's what they wanted for super soldiers was the ability to use sacred geometry and visioning in your mind's eye that would turn on specific neurotransmitters so that you are functioning in this way over that way more efficiently at that moment done just with breathing and visualization. And you can do that just like you can. Okay, and you can manipulate a Manchurian candidate with using... <laughs> yes, you could, yes, of course. Yes, absolutely. In fact, you okay. can do the, all the kids coming in from Iraq all jacked up on adrenaline, and you can get them into cops where they shave their head and they start pumping iron, and the next thing you know, they're working on steroids, and then you can kid them with a little bit of scopolamine and watch how that handler works it. That's what's happening in America today. All the cops are, are jacked up on illegal drugs, not all of them, but a lot of them are weightlifting and taking steroids. And with steroids, you can manipulate them so simply with scopolamine or some other, what do you think the, Monta the Colorado shooting, that Batman thing was, yeah, you know, that was, the second handler, the kid, you could look at him, he was loaded on scopolamine, not Prozac. If they're on these drugs like Prozac, they're extremely easily That was, and you don't even need video feedback systems, which we were doing. That was earlier technology. And it's being deployed now. Yes, I see it everywhere. I have no idea what to say about it. I, uh, that's why I went into agriculture, uh, you know. I mean, I, I walked away from it when I figured out what I was doing. And now my pay grade is so low. <laughs> I have no idea what's going on today. I can connect dots and have concerns. I have some serious concerns. I, you know, I don't know they're true, but I am pretty good at what I do. And the dots I connect are kind of creepy. You know, we've been invaded by something, there's no question. And the 1% is not the 0.01%. And the 0.01% has been, I just posted his statement, yeah, the very top end, and his concerns on what's going on. Um, I don't know what it all means. And we're all here for the end game. And this is like probably an epoch, sixth one, that's ending. And the civilization's based around nuclear energy and electrical current. But I'm studying sound and, you know, movement, dance. It's, you know, like whirling dervish, other things like that. I, uh, I think there's something in these technologies. Okay. Well, Rick, yeah, you, must know what, you must have some idea about what they're doing in CERN. I don't know if you have any contacts. Oh, I do. <laughs> okay, so... <laughs> Yeah, I knew you wanted to do that. 
Well, even when I was teaching metaphysics at Harvard through IES, um, I met Skull and Bones. Every bureaucracy has an occult element for the last two or three hundred years reserved for ultra elite magic, magical lodges, had your finest poets, Shakespeare, Byron, whatever. They, they were all part of lodges and lodge work. Now, I've got a video showing a bunch of scientists at CERN doing ghost dance, uh, trying to bring on biblical prophecy at uh, their way of interpretation. And I find that very creepy. It isn't going to work because there's something else going on. <laughs> but at CERN, is trying to create a singulate, which would be a gateway for Apollo. You know, Enlil, whatever name you want to, Kali, uh, whatever. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Well, okay, that's very good. You know what? You just revealed more in the last three minutes about what's going on at CERN than probably everyone who's out there making videos about it. Oh, right they're, they're biblical, prop, they're uh, zealots, who knows. Um, a zealot, by the way, you have Minerva and zealot, and then minor adept, major adept, adeptus exemptus, you know, it goes up there. Yeah, zealot. Um, zealots are um, like voodoo, and someone needs to take that phone for me, please. It's like voodoo. It works if you believe it, <laughs> because the black box is your mind. Okay, now, I, I, I'm sure that that's the government on the line just telling you to shut the phone. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> okay. right, here, right here in front and it's five, five, eight, two. they're leaving a message thank you uh, it's probably the government I doubt it all governments have magical orders and uh, that's one of the reasons when I came out of grad school I studied hermetic Kabbalism I did my own Bible translations I didn't find answers in physics where are you going to go and so where I ended up uh, was as a hermetic Kabbalist. I'm not uh, Judaic or Hebrew, uh, but I, if you wanted to qualify me as a Quaker, that might be right. I've got friends that pray for me. <laughs> I need a lot of prayer. <laughs> uh, but I know that I don't know what's going on. And when I see scientists doing ghost dance, I have to question uh, the creepiness of security there. And it'd be like there's a video that Matt Stein and some friends made called uh, Black Star. And it's about the Santa Barbara takeover of the grid and how easy it would be to take over the grid. And CERN <clears throat> is kind of like a Fukushima, a possible accident waiting to happen. And while when we did our first nuclear testing in the atmosphere and we're worried of a solar storm that might happen from that, uh, which is still a possibility and why we ban it. Here we are turning on and creating a singulate, a mini black hole. Now, what do you think that's going to do to the Earth and uh, over the next, you know, whatever time it takes for that hole to go from this point to that point? Well, it will do that. 